Welcome to Zimmerman Podcast, Episode 9. Did you know we are born with natural-born strengths? Seriously, think back on your early childhood. How do you foster creativity in kids? How can you avoid being a helicopter parent? How do you help nurture kids' dreams and help grow their confidence and social connections? How can you treat your children like the complex human beings they are from the very beginning? We're covering all of that in this week's episode of the Zimmerman Podcast. Now, because I'm sharing parenting advice, it's going to sound like I think I'm this great parent who can tell you what to do. That is not at all the case. These are just the parenting principles I value that work for us. Some days it goes pretty well. Other days, I fail at pretty much every one of my idealized principles. So know that I'm just sharing how I try to foster independence and confidence in my own kids and what that looks like. And if you want to learn more about that, then keep listening. Welcome to the Zimmerman Podcast with your host, CEO, wedding professional, educator, and mom, Jessica Zimmerman. In just two years, Jessica went from facing bankruptcy to taking home a six-figure salary. She turned a business-saving $100,000 loan into a million-dollar empire. As a creative entrepreneur, a healthy work-life balance seems just as unattainable as a six-figure income. But Jessica Zimmerman is here to show you it's possible. With the right tools and insider tips and some hard work, your craziest dreams can become your daily routine. If you set some boundaries and commit to healthy changes, you can create a business and a life you love. So let's make your business work for you. As a mom of three kids, one six-year-old girl, Stella, and twin four-year-old boys, Perry and Zeke, it's important to me that I raise kids who have independent interests, who are confident and kind. Independence is a big one for me. In fact, I totally freaked out when I found out I was having twins, like laid on the bathroom floor for hours sobbing. Part of that was that I had a daughter who was just over a year old, and I knew how much work one baby was, and here I was about to have two more at the same time. But the real reason was that twins totally freaked me out. (laughs) I was so afraid that they would be identical, and my doctor could not tell me if they we're going to be identical or fraternal. We would not know until the day that they were born. So as a natural born planner, I, of course, was not thrilled with the idea of not knowing the answer for several months. I was so afraid that they would be identical and that they would each struggle to find separate and unique identities. Now, remember, I'm pregnant with twins, so my hormones are going crazy. I'm not thinking rationally. I know lots of sets of twins. I know identical twins. In fact, two of my really good friends are the most amazing identical twins ever. And of course, I can tell them apart. Of course, they have their own interests and their own identities. But it was a combination between the hormones and just being really scared of what I had just found out that was making me think all of these things. I was so afraid that they would be identical and would each struggle to find separate and unique identities, that physically they would be hard to tell apart, that socially they'd become reliant on each other. I also feared that if they ever lost each other, that it would be totally debilitating. I lost my sister when I was a child, and I know firsthand how painful it is to lose a sibling. And We've all heard these stories about twins, that there's just a bond that's even deeper than your average sibling relationship. And all I could think about was if one of them lost the other one, how on earth would they go on? Having twins allowed me to become even more passionate about raising children who are independent from each other and curious about individual interests. I've always had the mindset that raising confident and independent adults starts early, in the baby and in the toddler stages. My parenting approach centers around treating my children like whole people, like human beings, with feelings and emotions and interests and their own thoughts, not like little kids whose words didn't matter. So today, I'm sharing my top tips to fostering confidence and independence in my toddlers that will have, hopefully, lifelong, life-giving effects. And while Stella isn't technically a toddler anymore, I definitely was doing all of these things when she was one, and I think they still apply at the age she is now. Principle one, avoid comparison. 
when I first found out I was having twin boys and when my doctor said, hey, we, we can't tell you if they will be identical or fraternal until they are born. I thought, well, okay, I'm going to go into preparation mode. I'm going to be prepared for this. I am going to be able to tell my sons apart uh, in the event that they are identical. And so I bought all white clothes for Perry and all blue clothes for Zeke. I knew right away that the first son born would be Perry and the second son born would be Zeke. And Perry would wear the white clothes and Zeke would wear the blue clothes. And that way I would always be able to tell them apart. When I looked back at pictures from when they were babies and they said, hey, mom, who's who? I would be able to tell because I would know the secret. Perry was always dressed in white and Zeke was always dressed in blue. If people came over and they said, which one's which? I would be able to tell because I'm their mom and I'm going to freaking know which son is which. So that is what I did. And I bought white blankets and I bought blue blankets and everything was either white or blue. A couple weeks after they were born, we went to see their pediatrician. And I remember sitting in the office and saying, well, you know, Perry has been coughing a little bit and, you know, Zeke hasn't been coughing at all, but okay. So Perry, and I just kind of kept doing this. And she said to me, and she, I guarantee you has no idea what an impact this made on my life, but she said something that was absolutely pivotal and life-changing at that moment. She looked at me and she said, Jessica, if you didn't have Zeke, if you only had Perry, would those couple of coughs a day mean anything to you? Would you notice them even? And I thought, no, I probably wouldn't. And then she said something to me that forever changed the way I parented. She said, you have twin boys. You will naturally always have a reason to compare. They were born 60 seconds apart, but they are two completely individual people. They're going to grow at different rates. They're going to like different foods. They're going to have completely different facial features. So always ask yourself that. If I just had one of them, would this be a big deal? Would this be an issue? If it would be, then it's time to come in and see the pediatrician. If not, you're probably okay. I remember after that appointment having to, you know how at those appointments you have to like completely take all the clothes off of your babies and weigh them and all that stuff. So I remember putting all of their stuff back on them and putting them in their carriers and getting them out to the car and putting them in the car. And then when I finally, what seemed like an hour later, got in the driver's seat, I remember thinking for the rest of my life, that is that is what I will do. I will look at Stella, Perry, and Zeke as if they are the only one when it comes to what is best for them. When I speak about my children or I speak to my children, I make comments or I encourage them in ways that are separate from their context within their large group of siblings. I am 100% able to build one up without contextualizing it with how another sibling is doing. I don't say Perry is great at basketball, but Zeke loves drums. If somebody is asking me about basketball, I just say Perry loves basketball. That's it. I don't need to say anything about Zeke if he's not part of the conversation. Perry and Zeke go to preschool. They are four years old. They have been going to preschool since they were one year old, and they've always been in the same class. And this year, my husband and I decided, along with the school, because bless the teachers and the faculty at that school, because from day one, I came in there saying, Perry and Zeke are two individuals. They are to be treated as individuals. In fact, we don't even use the word twins at our house. We say the brothers. And it wasn't until I believe last year that Stella even said, hey, mom, are Perry and Zeke twins? I heard that at school. And I thought, yeah, I should probably explain what twins are. But we don't refer to them as the twins. They are Perry and Zeke. So Bless the faculty at their preschool. I have always made a point to let their teachers and the faculty know that they are two individual human beings. And this really came to play when potty training came about. One of the teachers came to me one day and said that they had Zeke. They were trying to get him to go on the potty. And they were one of the things that they were saying to him was, well, Perry's doing it. And I said, no, 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 no. We don't do that. We're not ever going to do that. You cannot ever compare Zeke to Perry. Don't ever compare Perry to Zeke. They are going to go at their own rate. They are going to do their own thing. They are two completely different human beings, and they will be treated as such. And they, of course, completely understood that and respected it. And listen, I have a lot of grace and compassion for that because I was doing the exact same thing when they were two weeks old in the pediatrician's office. It's just a natural thing. It's a human nature way of treating twins. And they're going to be treated like that when they are outside of my home. So it's my job to make sure they know as best as I can teach them 
that they are two individual human beings. So they've always been in the same class and they've had the same teachers and they've basically always been with each other since the day they were created. And this past summer, the faculty came up to me and they said, listen, what would you think about separating them next year? And I thought, oh, I think that's such a great idea because they were going to have two four-year-old classes. And I said, oh, I think that's that's an excellent idea. And so I loved that, first of all, they came to me and they knew that that was something that would be important to us. But I also love that we did it. It wasn't easy. It's not easy to tell your four-year-olds who love each other so much and depend on each other in a lot of ways and are each other's comfort zone that they're no longer going to be together. But I also knew that the longer we waited, the harder it would be. And I knew in the long run, it was the best thing for them. And so we started the school year this year and they were in different classes and Zeke immediately did amazing. He immediately went from being a little bit of a quieter kid to leading the class in activities and having more of a voice and more of a presence in his class. Perry really struggled for a few weeks. He missed Zeke every single day and he would come home and he would say how much he missed Zeke. And he would talk about how there wasn't anybody to play with or things like that. And after a few weeks, he began to get the hang of it and he began to make other friends and he began to learn who he was without his brother. And I think it's been a really, really, really good thing for both of them. And it's been really neat to sit and to observe and to watch how they've grown individually as human beings. Another way that I avoid comparison with my children is I study them individually and I really try to hone in and become aware of what their natural strengths are, what their God-given talents are. I read an article a few years ago, and I wish for the life of me I could remember where I read it so that I could credit them. But the article was something, and I'm I'm completely paraphrasing, but something along the lines of, we are born with these natural talents, with these God-given strengths. And the only thing that really changes that is society. The article continued to say that they had done a lot of research and they had found that in our toddler years, those are the years where we really show, where we really express those natural born talents, those God-given gifts. And I think that's because as toddlers, we aren't concerned about what anyone else thinks. We're going to do what we want to do because we want to do it. So that is such a paramount time to really study your child. So here's what I've noticed with my three. Stella loves to draw. She loves to draw. She loves to paint. She loves to color. She loves anything to do with arts. Stella is also a really good student. If she is interested in something, she will learn it and she will learn it well. I can tell already that Stella raises the bar high for herself. No one else sets that bar for her, but but she has set a high bar for herself and she wants to be really good at things. Stella also cares a lot about her teachers. She wants to make them proud. She wants to do good work. The best thing that could happen to Stella is for a teacher to tell her good job. The worst thing that could happen to Stella right now is for a teacher to say she didn't do well. Perry can build absolutely anything. It is amazing what this four-year-old child can build with magnets and with blocks and with Legos. The other day I walked into his room and he had built this three-story garage for all of his transformers. These are transformers that are a fire truck, a police car, he he likes to call it a dig dozer, an airplane, a helicopter. And this garage he had built was so detailed. It was so thoughtful. It showed exactly how the garage lid came up and the helicopter would be able to come down and land perfectly. And he even had stairs for where the pilot would would get out of the helicopter and how he could get out of the garage. It was really impressive and everything was thought through and it was really amazing. It's incredible what that little four-year-old boy can create with these magnets and these blocks and these Legos. I'm telling you, I could sit with those same exact tools and not be able to build half the garage that he built. Never. There's just no way. My mind doesn't think that way. Zeke is a trickier one. Zeke is a little harder to observe simply because Zeke also loves to observe. 
Zeke is more introverted. Something has to really make an impact on him, and he has to really be into something to get really excited about something. Zeke loves to read. Zeke loves to study what's going on. He likes to observe people. He likes to observe the outside and what's happening. He listens in school. This four-year-old boy, the other day he came home, and we were doing a dinosaur puzzle together, and he said, what did he say? Look, a pteranodon or a pteranodon. I don't even know the name of the dinosaur, but he knew that. And I thought, I don't think I ever learned about that dinosaur. And if I did, I sure sure didn't stick. And here he, he like knows the name of these dinosaurs. And it was incredible. So one of the most important things for me to do is to observe and to study each one of my children individually at what they like to do right now. Because here's the thing. I know that Stella loves, has always loved since the day that child could hold a crayon. She has been obsessed with coloring. I mean, this kid, the second she gets in from school, goes straight to her room where she has this art box. She brings it into the kitchen and she starts making cards for people. She starts cutting paper up and coloring it. Our home is just, it looks like it's a children's art gallery because I let her use some scotch tape and just hang her pictures on the wall. And she loves this stuff, right? So if one day she comes home and she doesn't go to that art box. That's okay that one day. But let's say she doesn't go to that art box for a solid week. I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to say, Stella, why aren't you drawing? Why aren't you coloring? Why aren't you painting? What's going on? Because here's what I bet you is going on. I bet you she probably painted something or colored something at school and someone said to her, that's dumb or that's ugly or that's stupid, or why are you drawing? Why would you draw during free time when you can get on the computer and play this game? Why would you do that? The thing that this article that I read a few years ago made so clear to me is that we are all born with these things that we naturally love to do. But at some point, someone puts down what we love. They either make fun of us for loving it, or they tell us that we're not good at it, or that we'll never be good at it, or that all these other people are better at it than we are. And we let what someone else thinks stop us from continuing to do what we love. And it usually happens at a young age, first grade, second grade, third grade. So then we stop doing it. Then we turn 18 and we may go to college, we may not, but we are left with the question of what do I want to do with my life? Which I think is the most ridiculous question to ask an 18-year-old. They haven't really even been given a chance to 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 live a life, right? They're asked, what do you want to do? And then they they can't think for a second about what they might want to do. They say to themselves, I'm not passionate about anything. There's nothing I'm good at. That's why it's our job as parents to watch our children, to observe them to look and see what is it that you are naturally good at? What is it that you loved doing as a toddler and a young, young child? Because if no one had ever said to you, and this is hypothetical, this has not happened, and let's hope it doesn't, but it very well could. If no one ever said to you that your drawing was ugly or stupid, you'd probably still be doing it. And then you might know without a shadow of a doubt that you love art. And so maybe you don't know what you want to do for the rest of your life, but you do know that you love art. So there you are at a fork in the road and you at least know which path to go down. You may not know the end of the story. You never will, but you at least know what curiosity to follow. So it's my job if Stella ever comes home and stops drawing to ask her why. It's my job if Perry ever comes home and stops building to ask him why. It's just my job as their parent to pay attention to what interests them, to watch them, to observe them, to get down on their level. What excites them? What puts a smile on their face? What lights up their eyes? There's something to that. It's not just because they're a kid. There's something to that that is naturally woven in their DNA that we need to pay attention to because there might come a time in their life that they throw that away for a minute or for forever. And it's up to me as Stella Perry and Zeke's mom 
to remind them that, no, this is what you love and it's okay to continue to do it even if someone else doesn't like it. Jessica's always teaching that your time is valuable. So is hers. So to make this podcast possible, we have sponsors. Here's a quick message about something Jessica loves. So in October 2019, I decided to write the entire first draft of my book in six days. It was intense. I knew I needed to be laser focused for those days. So you better believe I loaded up on my Beekeepers Naturals goodies every day that week. I took the bee-powered superfood honey to improve my focus and keep me alert. I also took a bee lixer vial each morning to clear out that brain fog. Truthfully, six months ago, I don't think I could have written this book in six days. I didn't have the mental clarity or the energy to do it. But my beekeeper's honey keeps me fueled and fog-free, and I can definitely notice a difference on the days I forget to take it. If you want to try out some of my favorite Beekeepers Naturals products and get 15% off, go to ZimmermanPodcast.com slash B. That's ZimmermanPodcast.com slash B-E-E. Hey, are you loving this episode? If you've been listening thinking, oh gosh, I'm so glad I found this. This is exactly what I've been needing. Then I need you to do me a favor. Take a screenshot of this podcast and share it on your social media. I can't reach more listeners like you without your help. And these early days and weeks of the podcast are absolutely crucial to building the listener base we need so that we can keep producing content that is free to you and answers all your biggest business questions. So share this episode, tag me at Jessica Zimmerman underscore, and then get right back to listening. Principle two, I do not speak them into a corner. I don't let my words have more power than they should. If each of my kids has an affinity for something, that doesn't mean anything for their future life plans. For example, if Stella draws a beautiful picture, I do not dare say to her, that's beautiful, Stella. You are going to be the best artist when you grow up. No, no, no. If Perry builds this incredible three-story garage for all of his Transformers, I do not dare say to him, Perry, you are going to be an architect one day. I do not ever want to put that on my children. I give commentary that is neutral and rooted in the present. I say, Perry, I love that. How on earth did you think of how to remove the roof so that the helicopter could come down? That's smart thinking, buddy. Or I'll say to Stella, I love how you used that light pink and then that hot pink and then that red and how that all kind of shades together. That's really beautiful, honey. But I don't dare imply what their future is going to be. I give commentary that is neutral and rooted in the present, not backing them into a corner for the future. They get to decide what they do and who they are. I'm living my own life. They get to live theirs. Principle three, make my expectations for them clear, crystal clear. I expect them to be kind. They don't have to follow my definition of success or their sibling's road to success. In fact, yesterday, Brian and I were at therapy and our therapist asked us, he said, where do you want to be in 20 years? Like, where do you see yourself and your family in 20 years? Well, we know that the kids will be 26 and 24, and we know that Brian and I will be good. We were together 13 years before we had children, and we had the best time. And so I'm not concerned about um, about our relationship. We really like one another and enjoy hanging out with each other. But we took that question, and we really kind of thought about it. And I said, I just want our family to be a unit, like to know that no matter what, we could all be living in a different country. I mean, I don't, I, it, that doesn't matter. What matters to me is that we are a unit who loves and respects and supports one another unconditionally. And when our therapist said, how do you plan to go about that? And he's right. He said, in order to make that happen, what do you need to be doing now to make sure that happens? And I said, you know, one of the things that I really want us to do with Stella, Perry, and Zeke is to continually discuss throughout their entire childhood and adolescence and teen years the definition of success, meaning 
their own definition of success and how all five of us will most likely have a complete different definition of what success means to us. All five of us will probably have a complete different definition of what a joyful life is for us. There are many different roads that they are allowed to take and we'll be happy for each other no matter what that road looks like no matter which one they choose. My only expectation of them is to be kind. We practice acceptance for those around us. For example, Perry, my four-year-old son, he has very long hair. (laughs) His hair is longer than Stella's. It's longer than mine. He's got long hair. And the other day he came home and he said, Mommy, there are a couple boys in my class and they said that my hair is like a girl's. And I said, well, what do you think? And he said, I love my long hair, but they said I look like a girl. And I said, "Uh, that's not true. And then I showed him pictures on the internet of a bunch of men with long hair and showed him man buns and those soccer ponytails and all these things from, from men. And I said, there are lots of boys that choose to have long hair. Do you like your long hair? And he said, I love my long hair. I said, so who cares what those other two boys think? If you like your long hair, then let's keep your long hair. If you don't like it, then of course we can cut it. That's your decision. But don't let what they think determine if you want to cut your hair or not. If you love it, then you need to keep it. Another thing that Brian and I teach our children is that there are different ways of being in the world. It's okay to express yourself and your feelings, and not everyone is going to get that, but we will always get that, and we will always be there for one another. In fact, we've taken the children to therapy once before, just so they could see it. We told them that this is a safe place where you can talk about your feelings and that mommy and daddy come here regularly. And that doesn't mean that anything is wrong. Just like we go to get a physical checkup or just like we go to the dentist to clean our teeth to make sure that that's healthy, it's good to go to therapy and to make sure that we're mentally healthy. I also tell them that I think therapy is fascinating because you're educating yourself about yourself. And it's really incredible to learn what all's going on. I teach them that we will root for each other. And when one of us achieves something that they're passionate about, no matter how the world values those things, we will celebrate it equally. Principle four, money is a means to time and freedom. And we can have power over money if we know how to use it well. When Stella was four years old, I started using three mason jars with her. I started talking to her about work. I told her how mommy and daddy work and the money that we earn pays for things like our home and the groceries and our car and the bed that she sleeps in and the clothes that we have and all of these things, right? I also taught her that money doesn't come for free, that you don't just get money. You have to be willing to put in the work. And so at the age of four, Stella started with just really small little things like loading the washing machine or taking the clothes out of the dryer. Now, what we did is we would give her a dollar. We would give her 10 dimes. And (laughs) looking back, I probably should have started with pennies, but it's fine. If they get this lesson, then it will be it will be worth it. And so for the work that she does, and we do not call them chores, she is not required to do the chores. So it isn't this task that I'm nagging her about. It's work. And if she wants something, she has to work to earn the money. Now, here's where the three jars come in. The reason why I do 10 dimes is because I want my children to grow up knowing to have it ingrained in their brain that a dollar really means 70 cents because 10% of that goes into a jar for giving, 20% of that goes into a jar for savings, and then the other 70% is going to go into your spend jar. I also take it another level and I teach them that if they choose to put more in their savings, on top of the 20%, then I will match it. And then I always say, because what do we never say no to? And then they go, free money. And I say, that's the only place where money is free. (laughs) If you work somewhere where the company is willing to match whatever you put in that account, 
then you always say yes to that because it's free money and we don't say no to free money. And so it's it's kind of cute. They do this little chant and I love it. So anyway, they always put in a, at least one more dime into that so that I match it. This past weekend, we went on a hike and it was a place we'd never been to before. So we went to the visitor center and we were getting a map and Stella saw this rock that she wanted. It was just this super shiny, crystal-y looking rock. And she said, mommy, I really want this rock. And I looked at it and I said, okay, honey, that's $4. So that is 40 of your coins. Do you have 40 coins in your spin jar? And I knew she did, but I wanted to ask her. And she said, yes, I think so. And I said, okay, if we get this, are you willing to give up 40 of your coins for this? Is this rock worth 40 coins? And she said, yeah, I think it is. I said, okay, what's well, your money? You've worked for it. So if you want it, I'll get it and you'll pay me the 40 coins when we get home. She said, okay. Now, could I have afforded to just pay for the $4 rock and give it to her? Yeah, I could have. But what good is that doing her? What is that teaching her? That she asks for something and she gets it? No, that's not how the real world works. That's not how life works. I am not here to raise children who like me and think I'm cool. I am here to raise human beings who will be really good citizens when they leave my home, who will be able to take care of themselves, who will be able to look after themselves, who will be able to afford things, buy things, know the value of a dollar, and will know what hard work really is. So we get home and we get her spin jar, and she counts out 40. I actually have her do that, to actually count out 40. She hands them over to me, and her eyes are huge. And I said, was it worth it? And she said, I really like the rock, but I, now I have to do some more work. Because she was only left with, you know, probably 20 more coins after that. And I said, yeah, you have to do more work to earn more money. And I think that was a good lesson for her. And that's what we do. If she wants a pack of gum, she has to buy it. Now, when it comes to the work, like I said, we don't call it chores. We call it work. And then we say we're getting paid. And that's when we come out with the coins and we distribute them. Their save jars are pretty full at this point. And then what we do when they fill all the way up is we go to the bank and we give it to them. And each of my children have a savings account. And I tell them that that savings account and that save jar because at this point, Perry and Zeke have jars as well. But those save jars are for the future. That is for them to buy or obviously to put towards <laughs> a car one day or a house one day or something that they want in their future. And I love knowing that they will have saved from the moment that they, they could comprehend what that was. I tell them, mom and dad, we provide for your needs. But you, my dear, you provide for your wants. Principle five, we are lucky to live the lives we live, and so we will cherish and live them well. We practice winning the morning is winning the day. We wake up before the sun rises and we pause to watch it. We may not watch the whole thing, but we take at least 30 seconds and we look outside. If it's cold, we look from the window. If it feels good outside, we go outside and we watch it together as a family for a little bit. But I always say to them, we're lucky to have this day. Not everyone got to wake up today and see this. And look how beautiful it is. It's a cotton candy sky every morning and every night. And this beauty is for us to take, but it's up for us to stop and look at it. And I'm trying to teach them that we are not guaranteed tomorrow. So stop a minute and be grateful for today. All we have is today. We are fortunate for today. We set intentions. It's the cutest thing on the way to school. I say, what is your intention for the day? Are you going to have a good day or are you going to have a bad day? And they go around and they say a good day. And now they've gotten to the point where I don't even have to ask. We get in the car and one of them will start and say, I'm going to set my intention. My intention today is to have a good day. And then I remind them that that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a perfect day because there is no such thing as a perfect day. That someone might say something that hurts their feelings or something frustrating might happen to them or something that they don't like, but it's all in the way we look at it. And if we can look at those situations and still be able to stay true to our intention that today is still good, then we will in fact have a good day. We also go around the table at night for dinner and we, we go around the table and we ask each other, 
what was your biggest failure today? How did you fail today? And I love doing that because what it is teaching them is how to reframe failure. So many times people don't try something because they are so fearful of failing. And I don't want them to look at it that way. I want them to see that failure is good. If you fail, that means you tried and that means you learned and that means you have clarity on how you want to move forward in life, right? But even as a four-year-old, if all they're getting from this exercise is knowing that failure is okay, then that's good enough for me. We teach them that giving is better than receiving. A few weeks ago, Brian and I sponsored a girl named Adelphine. She is five years old, which I think is neat because we have a we have two four-year-olds and a six-year-old and Adelphine is five. Adelphine lives in Rwanda and she has two parents who love her very, very much. And this program is incredible because what it does is it allows the child to stay with the parents that love the child very, very much. However, the child is so loved by their parents that they are willing, even though they don't want to, they are willing to place their child in adoption because they know someone else might be able to give their child a better life than they can. The only problem with that is this is a loving home and the child could go live with someone else and they could be sitting at the dinner table in someone else's family and be filling that chair. But let's think about the chair in Rwanda that's empty with two parents that love their child so much. And I have to tell you, that story breaks my heart because I can't imagine what that must be like to love my kid so much and not be able to provide for him or her. And so we sponsor this this beautiful, lovely, precious girl named Adelphine. And we pay $50 a month and that covers her school supplies and that covers her medical. And that allows her parents to keep her and to provide for her. And they both work. They just aren't able to make enough to provide their child with medical and to provide their child with uh, education. So we talk about Adelphine every single day. We have pictures of Adelphine and my kids know Adelphine and we talk about her family and we look at her living situations and we teach it is better to give than to receive. And once again, we're not judging anyone else's circumstances that Adelphine has a beautiful life there with parents that love her and her home may look different than ours and her neighborhood might look different than ours. And the way she gets water is certainly different than the way we get water, but we celebrate each other's differences and we help when we can. I want my kids to know that their value is totally independent from their achievements. I want them to have the freedom to follow their dreams, whatever they are, which means that we start talking about money from a young age. Money doesn't define our worth, but having it and being wise with it sure makes life easier. If your confusing or painful relationship with money is keeping you from knowing your personal worth, you gotta fix that. To learn the first step on how you can grow your personal financial worth so you can be confident and independent, go to ZimmermanPodcast.com slash know your worth. You better believe I'll be teaching this step to my kids too. Again, that's ZimmermanPodcast.com slash know your worth. Principle six, we are lucky to have the body that we have and we will take good care of it. We teach our children the importance of eating five colors a day. I don't care how you get the five colors, but just starting out at this young age, we want to eat five colors a day. That The more colors we get, the better that is for our body, the better our bodies feel, and the more our bodies can do. We teach our children the importance of being active. And we show this through example, but we also encourage them as well. They see that their mom and dad make time to work out every day. So we show that by example. On the weekends, we don't just sit in front of the TV all day and watch television. We go do something active, whether that's going bowling or going on a hike or riding bikes. We spend at least some part of the day being active. Unless, of course, it's pouring down rain outside, then yeah, we're sitting on the couch and watching a movie. This past summer, Brian was working at a different job and 
I had the kids home with me all summer and I was working out every day at 7 a.m. with a trainer. And so my children woke up at 5.30. We had breakfast. They all put on their workout clothes and we went to the gym together for my seven o'clock training session. And my trainer, God bless her, she worked out with my kids for the first 15 minutes while I warmed up on the treadmill by running. And she would do yoga with them. She would lift little weights with them. She would do jumping jacks and all of these things. And it just really was a wonderful thing for my kids to all summer wake up, work out, and then go on with their day. And they enjoyed it and they liked being active. This isn't anything crazy. This isn't anything about how you look. This has nothing to do with that. I have zero expectations when it comes to that area. This has everything to do with taking care of your health and feeling the best that you can, taking care of the one body that you have, because that is ultimately their responsibility. It's not my job to entertain my children. It's my job to love and parent them. Principle seven, lead by example. If my children see a mom who's constantly working, who is on the computer at 9 p.m., answering emails or writing a new blog post or on social media all the time, they are going to think that is what's normal. And they are going to think that that is what they are supposed to do when they get older. I don't ever want to set that kind of example. That is why I make a conscious effort because I know that I have six little eyes on me. I make a conscious effort to stop working when my children come home from school and to be present with them as best as I can. I don't want them to think that they have to have this life where they work into the wee hours of the morning. I don't want them to think that their eyes are constantly having to be on a phone or a device. I want them to see parents who are active, who go outside, who appreciate the sunlight and nature, who take care of themselves, who are grateful for each day, who work hard, who think about other people. And the only way that we can really teach this is to lead by example. Principle eight, I teach them to respect authority. Here's how I do that. No empty threats. If I say to them, if you do that one more time, you're not going to Susie's birthday party. If they do it again, guess what? I have to be prepared not to take her to Susie's birthday party. I cannot give empty threats. They have to know that their mom and dad are the authority in their household. They have freedom to talk to us and to give us their opinion. But at the end of the day, what mom and dad says goes. We have to teach this inside the home because they have to learn that there is authority outside our home, like the law. They have to respect the law. Teaching my kids to respect authority is is hard. It's not easy at all. Let me give you an example. Last year, I found out that Stella had lied to me. I had said to her, I think it was about this time last year, it, had, it was just Halloween, and I had asked her if she'd put any candy in her room because she wasn't supposed to have any candy in her room. And she told me, no, that she didn't. She didn't have any candy in her room. And the next day, I was looking for our dog, Sophie, and I found her in Stella's closet, and she was inside one of Stella's shoes. And Stella had clearly hidden some candy inside one of her shoes. And so that day when Stella came home from school, I asked her again, I said, did you have any candy in your room? And she said, no. And so then I showed her clearly exhibit A and the candy filled shoe. And she just looked so disappointed. And I said, you lied to mommy. And that is the one thing that you are not allowed to do. You can always tell me the truth. You are going to get in way more trouble if you lie than if you tell the truth. That is a guarantee. And then I said this, and this about broke my heart, but I did it because I knew it would be better for her in the long run. I said, tonight you have gymnastics. And guys, this gymnastics class last year was everything to Stella. Her like four best friends are in this class. She loved the teacher. I mean, she waited all week for this gymnastics class, never wanted to miss it. I said, tonight you have gymnastics and you're not going to be able to go tonight. And she just started crying and just like bawling her eyes out saying she would never, ever, ever lie again. And I said to her, Stella, that's your choice, whether you lie again or not. I hope that you don't, but you're going to have a consequence for lying to me. We're going to go to gymnastics 
but you're not going to be able to participate. You're going to have to go tell your teacher what you did and why you are not able to participate in today's class. And then you and I will sit there and you will watch your friends as they participate in tonight's gymnastics class while you sit on the side. And so clearly it would have been so much easier to just let her go to gymnastics or it would have been so much easier just to let her stay home. But I knew if she stayed home, she'd get into something else that she enjoyed doing and forget that she had missed out on gymnastics, that the only way this was really going to make an impression on Stella is if she had to sit there and watch her friends having fun and laughing and giggling and learning new techniques in gymnastics class with the teacher that she absolutely loves and her not be able to participate in that because she chose to lie. So we went to the gymnastics class that night. She walked up to her teacher and she told her teacher what she had done. And the teacher said, well, I was going to give you a certificate tonight, but because you lied to your mom, you're not going to get it. So hopefully next week you won't have lied and you can come back to class and you can get it then. And she said, okay. And I have to tell you, the girl hasn't lied since that I know of. (laughs) Principle nine, we don't live vicariously through our children. I have my own life. Brian has his own life, and my children are allowed to have their own lives as well. Yes, they live under our roof right now, and yes, we are responsible of taking care of them and making sure that they're okay, but they are allowed to live their own life. They are allowed to be interested in what they want to be interested in. They are allowed, when they leave our house one day, to live their life the way they choose. My only expectation of them is that they're kind. And finally, principle 10, no shame. Stella lately has been really obsessed with clothes and it absolutely drives me crazy because I have a capsule wardrobe. I have very few articles of clothing. I buy all of my children capsule wardrobes because I want them to understand that Clothes are not important in the sense of trying to impress other people or that's the most important part about you is what you're wearing. I don't ever want them to think that. And lately, Stella has spent a very long time getting ready. She will change her clothes multiple times. And I had a conversation with her one morning where I said, Stella, this doesn't matter. Like, this just doesn't matter. What matters is your heart. What matters is your interest. What matters is how you treat other people, like clothes, they just don't matter. They do not matter. Like I want you to just stop making a big deal about clothes because they're not a big deal. And it crushed her. And she cried and she cried. She cried harder that morning than I'd ever seen her cry. She went to school and I thought about that. I thought, how did I just handle that situation? How could I have handled that situation better? And then it hit me. What if clothes are really important to Stella in a different way? What if one day she grows up and all of that artistic expression that she has had through drawing and painting, what if that is cultivated into fashion design? What if this is what she really loves and I have just shamed her into thinking that that doesn't matter? That was a really important day for me. And that is when I realized we aren't always going to see things the same. What I'm trying to say isn't always going to be received the way that I want it to be received. And so that day when she came home from school, I sat down with her and I had another conversation. I said, hey, I want to talk about this morning in the clothes. And she kind of looked at me and I said, listen, I know that clothes are important to you. And I get that. I know that you want to express yourself through your clothes. And I know that you like trying on different things because you like seeing how they go together and how this looks with that. And I get that. And I don't want you to feel bad about that. However, what we have to work on is our time management. If you want to do that the night before and then pick out what you want, great. But we can't do that the morning of. And just for the record, we pick out all of her clothes on Sunday. We pick them all out for the week and she says she's great with them. But then the morning she wakes up and she gets expressive again and wants to try something different and puts on this shoe with it and then this shoe with it. And mind you, she just turned six, but this is her expression and I'm letting it happen. I made sure that I reassured her that this thing that she thought was important, that I recognize that it's important to her. And just because I don't think it's important for my life doesn't mean 
that I think that that is worthless or stupid or dumb and that if it's important to her, that I care about it too because I care about her. So it was a good conversation. And those are my top 10 parenting hacks. I hope you found this episode useful. It's not my job to tell you what to do in business or in parenting. I'm just here to share what's worked for me. And right now, at this point in time, this is what's working. Although knowing kids, as soon as this episode is published, we'll have changed something up again, I'm sure. Thanks for tuning in today. As always, if you have any questions, send them to ZimmermanPodcast.com slash ask. If you liked what you heard today, please rate and review this episode. Your opinion means the world to me and helps this free content reach more listeners like you. See you next time.